Gore Vidal has seemed to have always had his finger on the pulse of American politics. Vidal, as you probably know, has written some 22 novels along with plays, movies, and essays. I don't do memory lane much. Hi there, this is Nicholas Casimir, and I'm here with the director of a new film called Gore Vidal, The United States of Amnesia. Gore Vidal has been a thorn in the American establishment, of which he is, by birth at any rate, a charter member. Now, for a lot of people who don't know who Gore Vidal is, who is Gore Vidal? <laughs> Well, you have to come and see the film. Yeah. I mean, Gore Vidal was many things, a very uh, prolific writer of novels, plays, screenplays, uh, essays, obviously he wrote a lot of essays. He's sort of an, a figure that we don't really have today now that he's passed. We don't have these kind of cultural figures that are really at the center and commenting and critiquing the culture anymore, you know, who have the, the public forum to, to for people that want that people want to hear his opinion on everything that's going on in the culture. His whole career as essayist, playwright, novelist comes down to one thing, the terrible discrepancy between the possibilities put forward by the founding fathers and the actual results of what we got. I have been criticized for saying that there is no real difference between Republican and Democratic candidates anywhere. People say that a writer sees the future. He says, that's not true. He says, a writer doesn't see the future. A writer sees the present. Gore Vidal not only knew everyone, but he knew everyone <laughs> from political figures. I mean, uh, he knew the Kennedys, but he also knew Sting and Bruce Springsteen. And Paul Newman was a good friend of his. Yeah. So this man was a magnet towards... I well, mean, he really was. It's amazing to think that here's someone that in his 20s was friends with Eleanor Roosevelt and new political figures in Washington and New York in the 40s and 50s and people like Paul Newman, public figures, you know, he was good friends with Tennessee Williams. He sort of knew everyone in the inner circle of the literary world at that period, but also he knew the Beltway, he knew the mm -hmm. DC people and politicians and was sort of groomed to be a politician, so knew a lot of people in society. When you were interviewing him, was anything off limits? It wasn't so much off limits, it's that he would only answer what he wanted to speak about. You know, I would ask him about his personal life and he'd often joke and chat about it off camera, mm -hmm. but on camera he would just sort of dismiss the questions or joke about things. He would never go into any detail about his personal life. That was the hardest thing really to, to discuss with him. And the difference between a homosexual and a heterosexual is about the difference between somebody who has brown eyes and somebody who has blue eyes. Who says so? I say so. Was he a homosexual? Yeah, of course he was. He was definitely a homosexual. Um, you know, I think perhaps in his younger life he might have been bisexual. He mm -hmm. definitely, in some of the biographies about him, they refer to some affairs he had right out of school with this or that society girl that you know his family were trying to line him up with. Mm -hmm. But throughout his life he was a homosexual. You know, he had a long-term relationship with Howard Austin. He often refers to that as non-sexual, but you know, from all accounts, it was sexual in the beginning. All right. You okay. know, and yep. he definitely had affairs with very many other people in the sort of literary world at, as a young man, and you know, was prolific. Uh, he in his sexual life, it, to, in his own words, he was, you know, he he did enjoy sex. So you know. He was also very kind of forthright about the idea of, you know, sexual desire and, and just purely cardinal desire. It's like, I like to have sex and I have sex, and he even said, like, by, uh, if I remember correctly, in his 20s, I've had sex with thousands of people. Which is kind of amazing when you think about it in that era. We're talking the 40s now, like 40s and 50s, to say that is pretty radical. Yeah, I mean, I, I know that Gore loved to provoke, so, you know, when he had the attention of the media to say something like that, he knew it would give him a lot of coverage and mm -hmm. a lot of attention. And, but it was certainly true. You know, he would always joke about being a top, though. He was, all, he was sort of a man's man in that sense. He was quite, you know, um, had a lot of bravado and was very, a lot of machismo. And was, mm -hmm. he always described himself as a top. So, you know, even though he was openly gay, he was also sort of a very strong male mm -hmm. character, and, yeah. you know, and I think a lot of people in the LGBT community often sort of berate him for not being more involved, um, you know, in the, in the gay movement or when the AIDS crisis was happening and things like that. But, you know, I think Gord certainly did his part by writing The City and the Pillar in 1948, you know, one of the first openly gay novels. 
and just being so outspoken about his personal life and his personal choices. Mm -hmm. One of the hallmarks, one of the quotes that he's always remembered for, mm -hmm. will be remembered for, is saying there are no such thing as heterosexual or homosexual beings. There are only heterosexual and homosexual acts. And, Absolutely. A, and a lot of people sort of were, you know, especially today, would take offense to that, you right. know. But for him, this is just, you know, his whole theory was you just have sex, you yeah. know. And, it's, and he was never in denial that he was attracted to men, but you know. So I think he's a different era. And the fact that he did write, like, uh, as you said, the first, one of the first openly gay novels in the 1940s, and also Meyer Breckenridge, which is one of the first novels ever with a trans character yeah. at its core. And that book is still shocking, you know. <laughs> uh, there's no question that he was of the LGBT persuasion. Oh, absolutely, and you know, that Myra Breckenridge was a huge uh, storm, a media storm when it came out, mm -hmm. you know, and the movie that followed, and it certainly brought a lot of attention to that subject. So, you know, Gore definitely did his part, I would say. There's been some controversy of late about him being a pedophile. What is, what is that all about? Well, that was a shock to me, you know. I hadn't heard that before, um, and there seems to be a lot of bitterness around his will, which is, hasn't been announced, but you know, it seems uh, certain family members were cut out and apparently he's left most of his estate to, or all of his estate, to Harvard. Tim Tiemann, who wrote the article that those rumors came out in, happens to have a sort of tell-all book about Gore's sex life coming out right now. Mm -hmm. And these allegations are not in the book at all. It's something that you know, seems to have been stirred up and given publicity to the book. So I don't know what's going on with those allegations. That used to be the accusation, and still is for a lot of countries around the world, about homosexuals. They want to have sex with children. Right. You know? Yeah. And that's what is kind of disconcerting about these allegations is, like, it's that whole. I agree. I mean, I feel like they're unfounded. And I've, you know, if you read the articles that came out around the time mm -hmm. of the accusations, there's equal number denying them right. and defending him. So. You know, I do know that there's, there is going to be a challenge to his will, and I do know that the initial comments were coming from the family who were expecting to be included in the will, so it, I, I feel like there's different forces at work in, around those comments. Was Howard the love of his life? Because they were Absolutely. together. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, he was. Howard was the love of his life. You know, when I met Gore, Howard had recently died, and he was choked up about him whenever I tried to speak of Howard. And, you know, they, apart from being the love of his life, they were like best friends. They spent a lot of time together. Mm -hmm. They lived together in that house in Italy and, you know, drank and partied and played chess and had affairs, you know, openly in front of each other. And, had, you know, they, they, they were together all the time, for, is my understanding, you know. Go would often go away on book tours or whatever, but the rest of the time he lived with Howard. Howard took care of him. Howard was, you know, they were almost like a married couple. Do you think he wasn't given a serious credence because of his sexual nature of his novels? I think it did affect his writing career. I think in terms of, uh, you know, writing The City and the Pillar, he says that, you know, the chief literary editor of the New York Times wouldn't uh, review any of his work after The City and the Pillar. And in fact, that they wouldn't even read them. And so that must have affected him, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And he didn't write another gay novel until, well, until Myra Breckenridge. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, his work defined itself. I don't, I don't think his sexuality did. I think, it, you know, I think it was a different era. And, you know, even though he was, he did somewhat wear his sexuality on his sleeve. But again, I think it's something, for Gore, it's something that it's, it's not the leading edge of his personality. Mm. So I think for him, his sexuality is an act that you know, is, happens in the bedroom and it's not mm -hmm. defining him as a person. All along, I think the most useful and creative people in the United States from the very beginning is the men who have said no. And many men have begun to say no again. And when the chorus gets loud enough, the people march.